Hello, welcome to News Roast. I'm uh, Jolyon Rubenstein. I'm Hayden Prowse. And this is Three Courses of Metaphorical Conversation. Now, before we start this week's podcast with our illustrious guest, who we've mm-hmm. been trying to actually get on for quite a while, we need your help. Now, please, please, <laughs> tell your mates, us. Yeah, tell the mates us. about uh, uh, the podcast and, and give it a, a rating and review because mm. we are just about to, uh, you know, coming up really towards the end of the third series. And if this podcast is going to continue, it's going to be because of you, mm. our listeners, and uh, you rating and reviewing it and driving it up the chart, which helps advertisers want to advertise with us. Now, without further ado, let us introduce our guest, who I think it's fair to say we're both a pretty big fan of. Big fan, yeah. Um, incredible writer. Also a f- very close friend of a friend of mine called Tom Costello. Yeah, I love Tom. Yeah. Uh, we Great, have... guys. You want any other personal <laughs> friends? Got... Do you know my mate? Uh, I know a guy called Jamie Hill. Is it a good mate of yours? Or... No. Oh, I just wanted to check. You know, Hayden having good friends with, you know, people that Johan knows. This is a man who has done all sorts of things and written all kinds of books. And one particular book, which has been doing uh, the rounds, a lot of my friends have, have talked to me about it, is Lost Connections, which is a book that Johan released in January 2018 about depression and anxiety. And in 2015, Johan did a TED talk entitled Everything You Think You Know About Addiction Is Wrong, which, well, in February 2018, had clocked up 8.6 million views which Ooh. is you know a serious Ooh. serious amount um, so i had a weird experience related to that ted talk did you was, um, about six months ago i was in san francisco doing some research for something and i was sitting on a tram the ted talk is about what really causes addiction and it partly uses metaphor of this um this incredible experiment that happened about a rat cage anyway i was sitting on this tram That's and this incredibly good looking man was sitting opposite me and like ste- blatantly staring at me right and i thought oh, this is good is he checking me out this is great uh, but I sort of, sort of smiled back at him, but there was no, like, no attempt to initiate conversation. And as I was about to get off, he suddenly said to me, you? And I said, yes. And he said, yes. addicted rats, addicted rats in cage. <laughs> yes, yes. And he hugged me. And I was like, oh, it's not everything I was hoping for. But OK, I'll, I'll settle for it. You know. It is an extraordinary TED Talk. If you haven't seen it, I would highly recommend it. And um, I'm terribly paraphrasing here, but I think one of the core cool things you're saying, that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it's connection. Yeah, yeah. So I learned that in the course of research in my previous book, Chasing the Scream, which is about addiction and the war on drugs. And I don't think I would have had the confidence to write this book about depression and anxiety and what really causes them if it hadn't been for the fact that I'd already been on this journey about addiction. You know, there's a lot of addiction in my family. One of my earliest memories is of trying to wake up one of my relatives and, and not being able to. And like a lot of people in that position... I had very mixed feelings about addiction, right? I was never a believer in punishing people with addiction problems. But I was a kind of cauldron of, you know, there was part of me that was very compassionate, part of me that was really angry. And in the course of writing Chasing the Scream, I learned a lot about the real causes of addiction. And, um, yeah, I can give you a little kind of the headline of it, which is exactly what you allude to, that, you know, there's this experiment that changed how we think about addiction. I think I've, I've seen the TED Talks. There's the rats one with the where they choose, they choose the cuddly thing over the not quite over the cuddly. food. Is it that one? <laughs> Hayden, what what TED Talk were you? What, I like the idea of rats looking at cuddly things. And there was like, a famous oh, no, there's it's a famous cuddly. experiment where rats. We're thinking about the monkeys, the or monkeys the, uh, yeah. choose a cuddly mother figure, yeah. even though it doesn't have uh, milk in its breasts. Yeah. Yeah, o- over a, yeah. a metal one that does. So yeah, you've subconsciously starved, jumbled up. They morphed <laughs> rats and monkeys into a sort of weird They starve, exo- they starve to death because they go for the comfort of the cuddly yeah. mother figure over the actual food source. Yeah, yeah. No, this, is they like die. A, this is like you've created like a dystopian psychological version of the island of Dr. Moreau where all like animal experiments <laughs> yeah. merge into one horrific like chimera like beast. It's the, a monkey rat. The, the experiment you're thinking about is a very important one but the, which relates to something I wrote about in, in Lost Connections. But no, the, so most people think I thought Mm. Uh, addiction is caused by the chemical hooks in the drug itself, right? Mm. So if you said to, some most, said to me seven years ago when I started doing the research, what causes heroin addiction? I would have looked at you like you were an idiot and I would have said, well, heroin causes heroin, heroin addiction, right? Yeah. Clues in the name, mate, right? Yeah. Uh, we think if, you know, we're sitting here in a studio in Victoria, we think if we went outside and we kidnapped 20 people off the street and we injected them all with heroin every day for a month, yeah. like a sort villain in a saw film, at the end of that, they'd all be heroin addicts because they'd have this right. desperate physical craving yeah. for the chemical hook, right? And... Professor Bruce Alexander is a man who's really 
changed how we understand addiction. It was only when I went to go and see him in, in Vancouver and interviewed him a lot that I, that I began to see this differently. So he explained to me this story we have, addiction is caused by chemical hooks, yeah. comes partly from a series of experiments that were done earlier in the 20th century. The really simple experiments... Your listeners can try them at home if they feel a bit sadistic. Do they involve you, heroin? Or? They do involve heroin. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, you take a rat and you yeah. put it in a cage and you give it two water bottles. One is just water. The other is water laced with either heroin or cocaine. Mm. If you do that, the rat will almost always prefer the drugged water and almost always kill itself quite quickly, right? Mm. So there you go. That's, that's our story. But in the 70s, Professor Alexander came along and he was like, well, wait a minute. You've put the rat alone yeah. in an empty cage which got nothing to do except use this drug. Mm. What would happen if we did this differently? So he built a cage that he called Rat Park, which is basically like heaven for rats, right? They've got loads of friends, yeah. they can have loads of sex, they've yeah. got loads of cheese, they've got loads of colored balls. Everything that makes life meaningful for rats yeah. is there, right? Yeah. He called this Rat Park. And they've got both the water bottles, the normal water and the drugged water. And of course they try both, they don't know what's in them. This is the fascinating thing. In Rat Park, they don't like the drugged water. They don't use it very much. You're joking. They don't you know, go and have like big rat parties with they, all the heroin they, and Tragically not. And yeah, they don't listen to, like, Reed, listen to Lou Reed, Lyra. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. They, you know, they hardly ever use it. None of them ever use it compulsively. None of them ever overdose. Yeah. So when rats have the things that make life meaningful, they don't want to be they out on the all heroin. The time. Wow. So what it tells us is the core of addiction is about not wanting to be present in your life because your life is too painful a place mm. to be. There's loads of human examples. Obviously, that in Chasing the Scream is partly about that. And I think, you know, to be honest, I wanted to write this book about depression seven years ago. Yeah. And I was so afraid to challenge my story about it that I figured it would be easier for me to write a book that required me to go and spend time with hitmen for the Mexican drug cartels mm. than to go and challenge this story. Because when you have a story about your pain, even if it's not working very well, it really structures your, your, your whole way of thinking about yourself yeah. and the world. Mm. And I think it was because with Chasing the Scream, I went on this journey about addiction. I discovered there's this very different way of thinking about it that opens up very different solutions. So it was partly the insights from Rat Park that led Portugal mm. in the middle of a massive drug crisis mm. to decriminalise all drugs and transfer all the money they used to spend on fucking people's lives mm. up, shaming them, arresting them, punishing them, into turning their lives around, which led to an enormous fall in addiction, right, that's right. overdose deaths and so Total on in Portugal. Total drop it in reoffending for, you know, criminals who... Yeah, and it, it incredible transformation. I spent a lot of time in Portugal, Switzerland, which is also inspired by Rat yeah. Park to lead to a different approach. And I think that kind of gave me the confidence to think, OK, this will be painful, particularly the bit where you're taking apart the old story you had. Mm. But if you stick with it, you will probably find a better story that will open up different solutions, ones that might work better. Do you see what I mean? Mm. So that ultimately led you to write this new book. The two books are sort of intimately connected, though, really. I think so. I think so. And they're connected in, in all sorts of ways. I think the reason I wanted to write Lost Connections is because there were these two mysteries that were really, had been nagging at me for a long time. Well, nagging's not the right word, but, you know, I'm 39 years old, right? Almost every year that I've been alive, depression and anxiety have increased in Britain mm. and across the, most of the Western world, right? And I was like, what's going on here? Why is this happening? And this is related to a more kind of personal mystery, which is when I was a teenager, I'd gone to my doctor. I'd explained that I had this feeling like pain was kind of bleeding out of me and I couldn't control it or regulate it. I was quite ashamed about it. And my doctor told me a story about why I felt this way, which I now realize was ridiculously oversimplified, right? He said, well, scientists have shown why people feel the way you do. There's a chemical called serotonin in mm. people's brains. Um, it makes them feel good. Some people are naturally lacking it. You're clearly one of them. All you need to do is take these drugs and you'll feel better. So I started mm. taking an antidepressant called Siroxat. Felt immediately and massively better. And for a few months, I was, you know, felt really good. And then this feeling of pain started to bleed back through. So I went back. He said, well, I didn't give you a high enough dose. Clearly gave me a higher dose. Again, I felt better. Again, this feeling of pain came back and I was in this cycle of getting a higher and higher dose until for 13 years with a couple of short breaks, I was taking the maximum possible dose that you can take. Mm. At the end of which I was still depressed uh, and I was experiencing all sorts of horrible side effects. And I think, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to understand what, what, was, what was really going on then, at some level I knew it couldn't be just a chemical imbalance in people's brains because why would it be growing so much, right? So mm. I ended up going on this big journey over, over 40,000 miles. I wanted to interview the leading experts in the world about what causes depression and anxiety and what solves them. 
and people who have just really interesting different perspectives from an Amish village in Indiana, because the Amish have very low levels of depression, to a city in Brazil that banned advertising to see if that would make them feel better. That, Don't yeah. cut to your yeah. advertising break while I say yeah. that, by the way. <laughs> to, 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 to a lab in Baltimore where they were giving people psychedelics to mm. see if that would help them. And I think the main thing I learned, I mean, there were loads of things I learned, but I, could, I discovered that there is evidence for nine different kinds of scientific causes of depression and anxiety that then lead to different solutions. But I think the, the, the core insight that unites all of them is I realized until I was a teenager and I went to my doctor, I thought my depression was all in my head, meaning, you know, I was just being weak. I needed to man up. I don't think the phrase man up existed then, but that sentiment mm. did. And then the next 13 years, I thought my depression was all in my head, mm. meaning it was just a chemical imbalance in my brain. And what I learned is there are real biological factors that can make you more vulnerable to depression and anxiety that I write about. Uh, and there are real brain changes that make it harder to get out. But actually, the vast majority of these causes, the bulk of what's going on, is not in our heads. It's actually factors in the way we're living. Mm. And that opens up a very different set of solutions which should be offered alongside chemical antidepressants, which do give some relief to some people but have the limits. Joel. Yeah, man. Do you feel like you're stuck in a bubble? Yes, definitely. A you huge know, social to, media bubble. Do you know how to pierce that bubble? Tell me, man. It's called the Economist Pin. Go on. You get a subscription, pops the bubble, and you're open to all sorts of ideas that you weren't previously exposed so, to. Are you telling me that if I go to economist.com forward right. slash roast, yes. I can get a free copy That's delivered right. directly to my door? You probably think it's just about economics and finance. It's not. It covers business, science, technology, arts, the environment. It's literally your entire dinner party conversation for the next eight months. I've been reading a really interesting thing about uh, big data oh, yeah. and the kind of realities of how you know Cambridge Analytica um, is just really the tip of the iceberg. Absolutely. And I think there's kind of like really interesting stuff, you know, for someone who's kind of, I'm interested in technology, but I'm not like, I wouldn't say I'm like a techno geek. Like there's so, such interesting stuff about like the internet of things and just stuff I would really genuinely never really would, know about. I think I was reading the same article in theeconomist.com about big data. And there's this huge argument right now about whether or not all this data that people like Zooks is, is uh, collecting on us is a good thing or a bad thing. Obviously, you don't want Zooks all up in our business. But at the same time, it's going to make society easier, more streamlined, more mm. effective for all of us. So it's a very d interesting debate. And these are the kind of debates that do happen on The Economist. The Economist has been open for over 170 years and the reality is that uh, because of you know journalism we don't really need to tell our listeners mm. actually really well researched journalism that's right. is hard to come by and this is definitely that so check out uh, the, the the deal that we've got for you like I said if you go to theeconomist.com forward slash roast you can get a free copy delivered directly to your door which is pretty pretty dope that's right even you lefties out there don't worry The Economist is a balanced magazine that gives you both sides of the argument and increases your brain mass by up to 30% not proved uh, scientifically go to economist.com forward slash roast and get your copy now delivered to your door So, Johan, what have you brought for our metaphorical starter? So, I'm really interested in this question of what is wrong with the British and American idea of what it means mm. to be happy. Mm. And I learned about this uh, in the course of research in Lost Connections. I went to Berkeley and interviewed an amazing woman called Dr. Brett Ford, who did this research that really, I found really challenging. And in some ways, it's really simple research. And maybe some people listen to this and go, it's obvious, but it made me force me to think differently about how I have been living. So she wanted to research with her colleagues, a kind of simple question. If you decided you were going to put more effort into trying to be happier, mm. would you actually become happier? Right. So let's say you decided you're going to spend two hours a day trying to make yourself happy. Would it work? Right. Mm. What's your kind I of don't instinct? Think so. Well, it's really interesting because we actually had this exact conversation. Do you remember having this conversation? Yeah. Literally like about yeah. a week ago. And I actually think that it probably makes a huge difference because I think that um, we've actually just got back from America and obviously America and, and Britain twinned with a language that disguises just gigantic chasmous differences in the psychology of people. But I think certainly from my perspective, you know, being a, a liberal sort of North Londoner who had emotionally intelligent parents but who recognized through therapy that their form of emotional intelligence when you look at the parents that they had who were you know brought up in you know the 20s and 30s who had very little 
by means of apart from intuitively mm -hmm. what that sort of emotional bond was with their children you know my dad for instance yeah, I hope you don't mind me saying this dad had, had, had a father who spent most, most of his time either under a car or in a study and then you know when he was you know bad or his brother was bad you know they'd get the belt and so his form of emotional intelligence and what he could give you know to his children was in his mind hugely evolved from where you know his, yeah. his, his his father had been but then for me and certainly my own journey I, i've been quite open on this podcast you know i think it's every single person in the world should go to therapy and I, I was you know in therapy for, for sort of seven years and if I had not decided to go into a dialogue with myself then my own um, evolution as a person and my own sort of self actualization would have been completely different and it even opened up for me the concept of a spiritual practice something that as someone who you know doesn't believe in monotheistic religions thought was like so completely mm. not something I would ever be a part of but if I didn't do yoga and I didn't do meditation I'd actually sort of I think I would be a far less happy human being I imagine you're probably going to say to me it makes no difference at all now but I imagine for me it, it, it made quite a difference I don't know I think you, you, you've got there in embryo the kind of core core insight that came from this study. So they discovered something really weird. They looked at um, this, this question in four countries, in the United States, in China, in Russia, and in Japan. And what they found is in the United States, if you try to make yourself happier, <coughs> you do not become happier. But in the other countries, oh. if you try to make yourself happier, you do. And they were like, what's, what's going on? How can that be? And what they discovered when they looked at it in more detail was, and, and with their colleagues across the world, was in the United States, and I'm pretty sure this is true, I mean, I spent half the year in the US and I'm pretty sure this is true of us as well in Britain. If you try to make yourself happier, generally what you do is something for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. You buy something for yourself, you try to get a promotion, you mm -hmm. show off on Instagram, you, you do something individualistic. Mm -hmm. In the other countries, on average, when you tried to do something to make yourself happy, you made you tried to do something for someone else, whether it was your friends, your family, your community. And it turns out the kind of individualistic vision of happiness that we're raised with yeah. just, just doesn't work, right? Um, it, it, for all sorts of reasons that we can talk about, but the collectivist vision of happiness doesn't. I think yeah, this is why right. what you just said is so interesting, because what you yeah. did is you instinctively moved, from, well not instinctively, through therapy and through developing a spiritual practice. I imagine that part of that spiritual practice moved you from this individualistic idea of happiness where do something for yourself, do something for yourself, which was very much, you know, not the whole of my personality by any means, but which certainly when I started to feel myself becoming depressed, generally what I would do would try to, was trying to big myself up, right? Mm. Uh, which I now realize was like, you know, those, is it Laurel and Hardy where they try to pull themselves out of quicksand by reaching yeah. into the quicksand <laughs> to pull themselves out, you know? So what is, was the difference between what the Americans did in the other, the other countries in order to, you know, contribute to their own happiness? What were the physical things that they went and did? Because aren't you saying that what they did in these other countries was stuff for other yeah, people? Yeah, for other people. Whereas in America, what did they do? Did they go, did they see a therapist or was it no, buying stuff? No, I think it was stuff, literally just it, they were more... Uh, buy themselves a pair of trainers yeah. and stuff. Just like exactly what, you know, what if we went to a school and asked, you mm. know, British school and said to kids, what do you think would cheer you up now? Right. They would mostly talk about stuff they could buy, right? Right. Because that's how we're trained for... I mean, Is it all material sort of acquisition? No, I think or it was, was it material... It was materialism, gaining status. Right. Yeah. So, you know, gaining status over other people. Yeah. And yeah. what were and what were people saying that they would do to make themselves happy in other countries? So it was things for other people, and I think it's a really interesting kind of illustration of what you were you were just saying. In, in a, it's kind of sub finding of one of the most interesting bits of research I looked at. So I was really as you as you guys know, and I think mm. you've talked about on the show before. Until the mid '60s, there was a lot of research into psychedelic drugs, yeah. medical research wasn't done to the standards we want to do now, but it was really promising and interesting, giving people. Um, yeah. like alcoholics and people with depression, LSD. She had really promising early results and then it gets all <laughs> shut down by the Nixon administration. Mm. And in the last seven years, been, there's been this reawakening. So I went and interviewed the people who've been doing this, who've been doing this science in Baltimore at UCLA, mm. in Los Angeles, in uh, NYU, in, um, here in London at UCL and in, in so, um, psil Oslo. Psilocybin yeah. and the effects that that can have has been transformative to a lot of people, hasn't it? So I was very struck by this early study, which is, it was looking at long-term smokers. They did this at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, which is one of the most prestigious universities in the world. People who have been chronic long-term smokers for more than 25 years, they've got to have tried to stop smoking in all sorts of different ways. I thought about this a lot because my mother smokes about 70 cigarettes a day. There's an amazing photo of me and my mum where she, I'm six months old, she's breastfeeding me, smoking and resting the <laughs> ashtray on my stomach. Right? And when I found this photo a few years ago and showed it to Brilliant. her, she, when I showed it to different her, era. Ago, she said, 
you were a fucking difficult baby. I needed that cigarette in <laughs> cunt, right? Like the, but, but so it takes people like my mum, right? Really chronic, tried everything, right? Well, to be fair, she's never tried anything to stop smoking, but <laughs> chronic long-term smokers, right? And it gives them three doses of psilocybin, which is the active component in magic mushrooms, mm -hmm. over, I think it was uh, quite a long period, I think they're two months apart. Yeah. 80% of them stop smoking. 80%. Wow. To give crazy. you a sense of, and have still stopped 18 months later. Why? So to give you a comparison, this is exactly yeah. the question, right? So to give you a comparison point, mm. the next most successful smoking cessation treatment, mm. nicotine patches, has a success rate of 17%, 17 yeah. 17%. Mind blowing, right? Similar studies with people that are suicidal with psilocybin, right? Yeah. So they're complicated, the, the depression ones. I'll get to that. And mm. I think it goes to the, what you're saying. So they were trying to figure out what's, what's going on here, right? Mm. These are such weird results. And they, kept, and they kept finding very striking results. They can lead to, uh, psilocybin can lead to a really significant increase in, in openness. For mm. example, what's called the personality dimension of openness. Mm. And what they discovered, there's a sub-finding, which I think helps us to understand what's going on here. So we've got to be very careful about when we're talking about psychedelics, that we don't repeat the mistakes of talking about chemical antidepressants in the 90s, which says, right. oh, it flips a chemical switch in your brain, right. it fixes all these things. What's going on, I think, is a little bit different. Um, so what they found is most people, when they take psilocybin, experience something like a spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. Like you, I'm an atheist, so it's not, I'm not, a type, I don't yeah. mean this in a religious sense. Um, spiritual experience where they feel a radical lowering of their ego, mm -hmm. a really deep sense of connection to the natural world, to the mm. people around them. But it turns out there's a big variety in how intense the spiritual experience is. So some people have a super intense spiritual experience, mm. and some people, a minority, have no spiritual experience at all. And it turns out the positive outcomes, like stopping smoking, mm. correlate really closely with the spiritual experience. So if you have a really intense spiritual mm. experience, you get a big reduction in depression, addiction, mm. and so on. And if you don't, have a spiritual experience, you don't get those benefits, right? And I think there's, there's a Amazing. debate about why yeah. this is. And I think it goes back exactly what you're saying, Jolly, about your, your own experience, which is, it's not that it flips a chemical. Of course, there is a chemical process in your brain when you take psilocybin, yeah. obviously, it's a chemical. But, uh, but what, what, what I, the best way it was explained to me, having interviewed loads of people who took part in these trials and all the scientists involved in it, is what it does is it gives you a spiritual insight of what it can be to be deeply connected and to live in a radically less egotistical yeah. way, right? Now, it doesn't last, right? Mm. So what you then have to do, and this goes to what you asked about, I think it's a really important Score question. Score some more mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, just replace Siggy. <laughs> go do some mushrooms on the bus on your way into work Can or I, whatever. Mushroom breaks at work. There's a, there's a, um, just quickly on yeah. this before we move off psilocybin, because I read this piece recently about mushrooms, which was fucking mind blowing, right? Mushrooms, I had no idea about this. Some of them are over three, four thousand years old. The mushroom is just the sort of um, above earth manifestation of a network of what are essentially veins or sort of very thin roots that can travel or sort of spread over, you know, hectares and hectares of land, right? And that is essentially what the mushroom is. And the, the thing that sprouts above Earth is just it's essentially its way of sort of spawning and spreading um, over, you know, wider areas. And in this piece, they were talking about how before the Earth was actually um, greened, before plants were, you know, it was all sort of molten lava and all the life that existed lived, lived in the sea, the first things that came on land to prepare the Earth for the trees that would come after were the mushrooms. Wow. The mushrooms basically enriched the Earth uh, and made it possible for plants to grow on land. Mushrooms were the first things. One of my first, one of I my favourite that. uh, TED Maybe that's talks. connected to it somehow. Well, know. I don't know. I mean, quite possible. I mean, one of my favourite TED Talks, is, is, which was banned, was Graham Hancock's one about consciousness. And when he was talking about how is it possible that these, you know, was it, was it psilocybin, mm. in fact, that actually gave us the, the idea of, you know, uh, of sort of deifying ourselves or painting on walls of mm. kind of, you know, actually sort of representing and anthropomorphizing other animals as us yeah. because our consciousness is connected. But just going but back just, to, just, to, just to the other I don't thing. want to forget that about Hayden, just because you raised a really important one, which mm. is about the, giving psilocybin to people with depression, mm. people who've had suicidal thoughts. And again, it fits with this wider insight. So I interviewed, you guys, you should definitely have on the podcast, Dr. Robin Carhart-Harris, who led the study here in London at mm. UCL, giving psilocybin to very depressed people. And again, it, it's a slightly more complicated finding than the kind of yeah. more kind of, um, uh, how would I put it, more unthinking cheerleaders of psychedelics put, but it's a really important insight about mm. psychedelics. So they take people who've got what's called long-term resistant depression, mm. right? 
obviously people who've been depressed for a really long period of time and nothing's helping them. And they give them psilocybin. Mm. And there's a woman in the trial who to me is a, and, and it had a really <coughs> positive effect, but there's a woman in the trial who to me really um, helps us to understand what's going on. So this woman who worked in an um, uh, office in a seaside town, I think she, she was a secretary, she comes in, she does the psilocybin trial, she has this incredible experience of egoless connection. Mm. It's incredibly transcendent. She goes back to her work in this office in a seaside town, and the way she put it is, she just couldn't live according to that those insights in that yeah. in that environment. Right? Yeah. It's not possible. Try going around an office thinking that you're equal to everyone there, and you're mm. you know you're all connected, and what matters is not you right. know meaningless work, but actually you know love, yeah. and you're not going to keep that job for very long, right? Yeah. So. The environment militated against the insights. And to me, right. the most important thing about psilocybin and, and the psychedelics research is, look, most people are not going to want to take psychedelics at all. Yeah. And even the people who do want to take them, who, who I'm a supporter of, even they're not going to want to take them most of the time. It's a very rare person who wants to take mm. psych psychedelics more than, you know, once, you know, a couple of times a month, right? I know a few people. But, but, what, but, <laughs> but what it does, but they're a small minority, right? Yeah. So what, what, what I think it helps us to... To understand is more, and this was true of a lot of the different kinds of solution to depression and anxiety that I write about in the book. It's more like what what that experience with psilocybin gives us is like um, a compass pointing in a direction right. of travel towards living in a more connected way, towards living in a way that's less mm. egotistical. And obviously, the book is about partly well, how do we do that in ways that's not mm. just taking psilocybin? Yeah, know, valuable though that is. So you have to essentially change your, you know, the realization that you come to through taking the psilocybin. You, you then have to consequently take uh, change your life in order to achieve happiness and come out of the depression. I would put it slightly. I think that's right. But I, I, remembering the lesson of what Brett Ford found about thinking collectively rather than individually. A lot of people listening to this will think, right, but I can't change my life, yeah. right? One of my closest relatives yeah. is a you know really struggling single mum who works every hour she can, uh, gets home, uh, and just collapses and is too knackered to even watch Coronation Street. Yeah. So the idea is saying to her, you need even, to now even change your... watch Coronation Street. <laughs> no, no, Ooh. just seeing a Coronation yeah. Street, don't get me wrong. But like, yeah. the um, saying to her, well, you need to change your life, yeah. um, I think is missing the point about collective... I think one of the cruelest things we do with depression and anxiety is we put the onus for solving them onto depressed and anxious people. Yeah. We don't do that with car accidents. Yeah. We don't say the job of fixing car accidents lies with people who've just been mangled in car crashes, right? <laughs> right. We have seat belts, we have airbags, yeah. we have yeah. driving tests, we arrest yeah. drunk drivers. We have a whole range of things. The whole And mm. one of the really important things I learned is because so many of the causes of depression and anxiety, not all of them, yeah. so many of them are social, they're in the way we live, Actually, the best response is for us to change collectively the way mm. we live that would give people like my relative a margin to change their life more in line with these insights. Now, there are things that individuals can do, obviously, and I talk about them yeah. a lot in the book. But to me, the biggest changes are collective changes. So I would agree with everything you said, except I would say it's not you need to change your life, but we need to change I our think life. That's a huge problem, though, societally, because apart from the fact that I think that even within, say, let's just call them the liberal elite for the time being, even within the liberal elite, I think there is so little understanding basically of our own emotional needs and our own need to connect with other people and community as something that's vital now we've all probably got friends who've worked in the charity sector in aid work and aid work is supposed to be one of the most addictive professions you can do and it's no surprise to me that what you're saying is that the core of a lot of these studies was not actually just doing something for yourself but doing something for other people being part of a community mm. and simultaneously you know in the last 10 years so many of my friends have had children and their lives have been and their personalities have tr transformed and evolved mainly because their lives are not about themselves they're about giving care and watching that nurture that energy lead to positive change but in this country particularly and we talked about Britain and America and what's different with these places what I find so difficult about America um, is sometimes they're like ludicrous over positivity about everything oh my god everything's awesome ridiculous but one of the most beautiful things I think about America was summed up when I spoke to a photographer friend of mine so I've got a photographer friend she's been going you around got a photographer friend. she's got a photographer friend, <laughs> she's a photographer friend and oh she's god. been going around uh, shooting the pop star Dua Lipe for the last sort of like three or four years and that's a pretty insecure job in a lot of ways you know you're a freelance photographer you don't know what gigs are next and the way that these two countries are different 
print in a way was summed up by their reaction. So if she's in England, she said that when she tells people she's a photographer, they say to her, oh God, that must be pretty tough. Are you not anxious about what, where's the next paycheck? Are you, it's not very secure life, is it? I don't know, it's a bit weird. Whereas in America, when she would say, I'm a photographer, they'd be like, that's amazing. You must get to travel the world. You must get to meet so many people. God, that's so exciting. <clears throat> and in a way there is this like innate negativity that seems to sort of be hardwired into so much of the kind of British stiff upper lip culture, yeah. which also I think disconnects people hugely from their own emotional needs. I think, I th yeah, the disconnection thing I think is really interesting and picking up on what Johan said about connectivity and sort of community, I think is really interesting because if you talk to older people, you know, your, your mum's generation sitting there with her fag, <laughs> they talk about our generation, you know, millennials or whatever we are, Gen Xers or whatever, as much more sort of self-involved and self-regarding and into a, you know, our own, it's, it's, it's all about us rather than about the community. They'll talk about that quite openly. And in many ways, I guess what you're saying is perhaps an, an, an aspect of that is responsible for this increase in, in, in depression in, in the UK and the US and certain other countries. But the kind of ideologies that kept people together back then also had their own negative aspects. Mm. Just because you went to church on a Sunday and you felt incredibly, you know, involved in a sort of community project that gave you purpose, perhaps, you know, helped hedge against a bit of depression in your life. There are other very negative things about having mass religion in a particular country, yeah. depending on the religion, depending on the, you know, the, the sort of branch of that religion. Same with other ideologies, whether it's socialism, whether it's uh, nationalism, prior to a, a war that you're about to embark on. I'm sure a lot of people didn't have much depression because there was some sort of collective purpose. But humanism is essentially the project that we've undergone, you know, since the 50s. That's, you know, Jeremy Bentham, it's all been about us, not serving a sort of, like you talked about, monotheistic religion, not serving a greater cause. You know, it's all been about us and our life experience. And we thought that would end in some kind of nirvana for ourselves, where we'd have everything we wanted. But ultimately, it seems to have made us more depressed. But how do we achieve happiness without going back to those old ideologies that have serious problems? I think you're to totally them? right. And you don't want, we absolutely don't want golden ageism. And we don't mm. want, you know, it's, there were all sorts of problems in the past. I think, I think, Jolene, you've gone to a really important one, which is this concept of one of the ways we find our ways out of this. Is, is this concept of needs. So everyone listening to your show knows that they have physical needs, mm. obviously. But there's equally strong evidence that human beings have natural uh, psychological needs, right? You need to feel you belong. You need to feel your life has meaning and purpose. You need to feel you have autonomy. Mm. You need to feel that people see you and value you. You need to feel you've got a future that makes sense. Our culture is good at loads of things. I'm glad to be alive today for all sorts mm. of reasons. But our culture has been getting less good at meeting these deep underlying mm. psychological needs mm. for lots of people. And, and so... This is certainly not the only thing that's going on, but I think this is one of the reasons why we have this growing crisis of depression, anxiety and addiction. And I think what's interesting is that these insights are just below the surface. In some ways, they're rather banal, right? In some ways, they're rather obvious. But let's pick a specific one. So we are the lonely... So I go through these nine causes of depression and anxiety in the book. I'll just give you one. We are the loneliest society that has ever been, right? There's a study that asks Americans, how many close friends do you have who mm. you could call on in a crisis? And when they started doing it years ago, the most common answer was five. Today, the most common answer, not the average, but the most common answer is none. Wow. Right? There are more people who have That's nobody. so sad. Exactly. And in these trends, Britain is just behind the United States in what's yeah. called the collapse of social capital, right? We are almost at the top of the league table along with the, the Americans and the Aussies. Mm. And... So I've been thinking a lot in the last week, actually, about this, partly because I was taught so much about this by an amazing man called Professor John Cassiopo, who tragically just died. He, it, was, it was a really terrible loss. Mm. He's the leading expert in the world on loneliness. He was at the University of Chicago. And he proved many things. So he proved that, for example, if you are acutely lonely, it releases as much of the stress hormone cortisol as if you are punched in the face by a stranger. Wow. Right? This is how, and his theory on why, which I found quite persuasive, was, you know, why are we alive, right? One of the reasons we exist it's because our ancestors on the savannas of Africa were really good at one thing. Mm. They were not faster than the animals they took down. They mm. often weren't bigger than the animals they took down. They were much better at banding together Community. in tribes. Yeah. Exactly, and cooperating, mm. right? Yeah. Just like bees need a hive, mm. humans evolved to need a tribe. And in those circumstances, if you were separated from the tribe, mm. of course you were flooded with a stress hormone. You were about to die, right? Were, that was a necessary mm. signal to get back to the tribe. Yeah. We're still that animal, right? That We still mm. have those impulses. Completely. And there's been this... So given that he proved that... that, that Loneliness causes depression and anxiety, and there's overwhelming evidence loneliness and, and, and loneliness has increased. 
So I started thinking, well, what is the solution to that, right? Mm. How do we deal with that? And it turned out there's an amazing guy not, not so far from where we are. One of the heroes of my book, a man called Dr. Sam Everington. So Sam is a GP in one of the poorest parts of East London. It's a place where I lived for a long time, although sadly he was never my doctor. And Sam was really uncomfortable because he had loads of people coming to him with depression and anxiety. Like me, he's not opposed to chemical antidepressants. He thinks they have some role for some people. But he could just see the best they were doing was taking the edge off for some people, right? Mm. Which is worth doing, but they weren't solving the reasons why people were depressed and anxious in most cases. So he decided to pioneer a different approach. One day, a woman I got to know called Lisa Cunningham came to see him. Lisa had been shut away in her home with crippling depression and anxiety for seven years. She'd barely left her flat in seven years. And Sam said to her, don't worry, I'll carry on giving you these drugs. I'm also going to prescribe something else. Mm. I'm going to prescribe for you to take part in a group. There was an area behind the surgery that was known as Dog Shit Alley, which gives you a sense of what it was like. He said to Lisa, what I want you to do is turn up twice a week. I'll come and support you. And with a group of other depressed and anxious people, I want you to turn Dog Shit Alley into something beautiful, right? First meeting, Lisa was literally physically sick with anxiety. But a lot of things happened in this group. The first was depressed and anxious people had something to talk about that wasn't how shit they felt, mm. right? They decided they were going to mm. teach themselves gardening. They started to put their fingers in the soil. They started to learn the rhythms mm. of the seasons. There's a lot of evidence that exposure yeah, to the natural right. world yeah, yeah, yeah. is a really powerful yeah. antidepressant. Mm. They also started to form a tribe, and they did what human beings do when we form tribes. They started to solve each other's problems, mm. right? For example, this is the extreme example, but one of the people in the group <clears throat> was sleeping on the night bus, mm. right? The drivers would just let him sleep on it. Everyone else was like, of course you're depressed if you're sleeping on the fucking bus. They started pressuring Tower Hamlet's council to get him a flat. They succeeded. Mm. It was the first time they'd done something for someone else in years. Wow. It made them feel great. The way Lisa put it to me, as the flowers began to bloom, we began to bloom. There was a study in Norway that found that a very similar program was more than twice as effective as chemical antidepressants. I think for an obvious reason, and I saw this all over the world, from Sydney to San Francisco to Sao Paulo, the places that were most effective in dealing with depression and anxiety were the places that dealt with the underlying reasons why we feel so shit in the first place. So how do you create these programs? What's the, I mean, that's great that this doctor did that, but do, do these need to be huge sort of NHS, you know, organised programmes where people are put into sort of communities that make them, give them that connection? Or, I mean, how do you do it? Is it a sort of big society type thing? What's the... Well, there's all sorts of structural changes that can happen. This is one of them. I mean, I think every doctor's surgery should work like, it's called the Bromley Bobo Centre that mm. Sam runs. So, uh, and by the way, those programmes cost literally nothing. They're all run by volunteers, right? right? So, and again, it, it helps you to see why we've ended up with this distorted picture about what causes depression and anxiety. It's not that there's no, there are real biological causes. It's not that there's mm. no, no truth in the, in, in the arguments about biological causes. And it is true that, that some biological interventions give some people some relief and therefore have real, real value. Mm. But how did we end up with this situation where, you know, I went to my doctor I was drugged for 13 years and no one ever said to me at any point in those 13 <clears throat> years, is there any reason you might feel this mm. way? It's partly because there's a $10 billion global right. industry in drugging mm. Lisa and there's a $0 billion mm. industry in getting her to go gardening and form yeah. a tribe with these people, right? But we, we're in a stronger position in Britain to deal with this than a lot of places because we have, uh, you know, it's, I mean, it's being whittled by the Tories, but we mm. do have a not-for-profit healthcare system, mm. right? This is something that could be, and, mm. and the head of the NHS said just before Christmas, mm. we should be rolling out this approach across totally. the whole country. Well, that is, you know, absolutely fascinating. And I think quite nicely leads us into your metaphorical main. Yeah, so it's really the subject of my book, in a shameless, shameless plug, which is what really causes depression and anxiety. And it's a lot of the things we talked about. It was so interesting traveling around, meeting these, these experts and kind of seeing these different ways of thinking about it. So I'll give you another example of one, a cause of depression and anxiety that I think a lot of listeners will identify with. I noticed loads of the people I know who are depressed and anxious, their depression and anxiety focuses around their work. Mm. So I start to look up, well, what's the evidence about how people feel about their work? That was mm. where I started. Best study of this, really detailed study by Gallup, found 13% of us, 1%, 3% like our jobs most of the time, right? <sighs> Six, <laughs> That's so small. It gets worse. 63% of people are what they call sleepworking. So they don't like their job, they don't hate their job, they just kind of tolerate it. And 24% of people fucking hate their jobs, fear and dread them, right? Oh, it's quite that means 87% of people don't like the thing they're doing most of the time. 
quite striking. I started to think, could there be some relationship between that and the fact that we have so much depression and anxiety? So I started looking around, uh, reading through the kind of best science on this, and I learned an amazing Australian social scientist called Professor Michael Marmot discovered a, a key part of this picture in the 1970s. So I went and spent some time with him. So he discovered loads of things, but just to give you the headline, the single biggest thing that makes people depressed at work causes depression is if you go to work tomorrow and you are controlled. Mm. So you have low or no right. control over your work, right? Yeah. And it totally fits with what we were talking about before, about people, what you, what you were saying, Jolly, on about people having needs, right? Mm. You need to feel your life has meaning. Yeah. And if you're controlled all the time, you can't construct meaning out of your work. And at first, I misunderstood this evidence. I had to keep going back and seeing Professor Marlott because I thought at first the implication of this is, okay, so you've got this 13% of people like us who get to have nice jobs that we like, and then you've got everyone else who's condemned to fucking misery, right? Mm. And I thought about, you know, my dad's a bus driver, my dad was a bus driver, my brother's a delivery guy, my, my, my sister's a nurse. I was like, wait, are we saying they're just condemned to, you know, mm. miserable lives? But Professor Marmot said to me, no, Johan, you don't understand. It's not the work that makes you depressed. It's being controlled at work. And there is a, there's a different way of doing it, which I think of as an antidepressant. I think anything that reduces yeah. depression should be thought of as an antidepressant, not just pills. And, and I went to see how this works. And when I explain it, lots of people are going to think, right, I can't do that, right? And of course, most people listening to this can't do that now. This is an argument for a social change about how our society works, and I'll explain how. So in Baltimore, I met a woman called Meredith Keogh. Meredith used to go to bed every Sunday night just sick with anxiety. She had an office mm. job. It wasn't the worst office job in the world. As she would tell you, she wasn't being bullied or harassed. Mm. But it was monotonous and, you know, she couldn't bear the thought this was going to be the next 40 years of her life. So one day, Meredith, with her husband Josh, did this quite bold thing. Josh had worked in bike stores since he was a teenager, which, you know, is insecure. I mean, even more insecure than in Britain in that you don't even have health care, that kind of mm. thing. And obviously controlled. You just have to do what the boss tells you. And one day, Josh and his colleagues in this bike shop were like, what does our boss actually do? Right? It's not that they didn't hate their boss, he was quite a nice bloke, but they were like, we seem to fix all the bikes and he seems to make all the money, right? <laughs> what, could we do this differently? They decided to set up a bike store of their own, but it works on a different principle. It's not a corporation like the previous place they worked in where most of the people listening to this will work, which is kind of top down, the guy at the top is like the commander of the army telling mm. everyone what to do. That's a very recent human invention, right? Mm. And it goes back to the late 19th century. What they did was set up a democratic cooperative. So they set up a shop called Baltimore Bicycle Works, uh, they take all the decisions about how the business works together. They share out the shitty tasks and the better tasks so no one gets stuck with the shitty tasks. They obviously share the profits. They control their environment. Mm. And it was fascinating talking to them and spending time there, totally in line with Professor Marmot's findings, how many of them used to be depressed and anxious when they were in this controlled way of working, mm. but were not in this different way of working. And it's important to say, it's not like they fixed bikes before and now they've gone off to be like Beyonce's backing singers, right? <laughs> they fixed bikes before they fixed bikes now. Mm. The difference is they were given control over their work. Mm. And as Josh said to me, there's no reason why any business should run in this top-down way that causes depression, right? Mm. Every business, every, what's called a corporation now, could be a democratic cooperative. It's right? kind of fascinating because a lot of these things are intrinsically linked. So what we're really talking about here is a network as opposed to a hierarchy. Yeah. And most actual corporate structures, surprisingly enough, have worked out that actually to work most efficiently, you create a network where different people have different permissions and can enter the, uh, in the way they want to do the work when they want. But also the idea of network is about community and community is about communication. And communication is what gives us a sense that we're heard and also gives a place to voice those concerns which otherwise run around in our heads poisoning us with a dialogue which is intractable mm. and basically a spiral down into your mm. deepest senses of self-worth like losing all perspective deep deep sense of like unhappiness and loneliness and fear and then unfortunately in all the <clears throat> stuff i've looked at is that it is, unfortunately, a self-fulfilling prophecy. The lower you get, the lower your expectation is that things will get better. And unfortunately, unless someone actually does reach out and grabs you and helps pull you out, your life you know, will continue in an intractable way. And I think that a lot of people talk about, you know, a lot of addicts, for instance, talk about hitting, quote unquote, rock bottom and what that means for them. And I, when I actually eventually got into therapy, had hit a type of emotional rock bottom. And I think that the fact is that in our society, as it's set up today, you know, if you want to look at the larger macro picture, mm. you have a political model, which Reagan and Thatcher pushed, up, pushed on saying, you know, greed is good, 
No. There is no such thing as society. And on the micro level, right now, you've got you know, little 11 year olds clutching phones, talking about Instagram before they even know what it is, mm. spending half an hour looking in a mirror, you know, mm. a, a, a Sunday lunch, trying to get the right selfie rather than just communicating. And, mm. and so what can we do like in our daily lives, like talking to our mates, you know, being quite unquote, a bit more woke to kind of get people to feel they can slowly start taking that first step, whether it's in the workplace or emotionally sort of together if they are feeling a bit anxious or, or a bit depressed, Johan? Yeah, so I go through loads of things in the book. I just, as you were saying that, because it can be so easy if you, when, when I talk about the deep structural reasons why we have this depression and anxiety epidemic, I understand why lots of people initially hear that as actually quite a depressing message because it's like... <laughs> the message that... itself is depressing loads of people. Because <laughs> <laughs> they think, well, fuck, you know... Oh, my fuck, no! <laughs> How ironic. You can see, and you can see yeah. why, right? Because there's because we've been we've been raised to think we have no agency, <clears throat> right? That, we, that these are just givens and we can't change them. Mm. And one of the reasons why I am quite optimistic about this, and I'll get to the more specific things individuals can do in a minute, is because I'm 39 years old and I'm gay, right? And I have seen unimaginable transformations that I thought were mm. inconceivable in my lifetime, right? I tell the the, the story in, in Lost Connections of a close friend of mine, Andrew Sullivan, right? So in 1994, Andrew was diagnosed as HIV. He's a well-known journalist, American journalist. In 1994, Andrew was diagnosed as HIV positive. This is the height of the AIDS crisis. Um, no treatment in sight that worked. And Andrew's first thought was, I deserve this because he'd wow. been raised in such a homophobic environment, right? Mm. So Andrew went to uh, Provincetown, which is a little part of Cape Cod, to die, right? And he decided as the last thing he was ever going to do, he was going to write a book mm. about something no one had ever written a book about before, a crazy utopian idea that he thought, well, I'm obviously never going to live to see this. No one living now will live to see it, but maybe somewhere down the line, someone will pick, this, pick up this idea. That idea was gay marriage, right? When I get depressed, I think, oh, fuck, this is so big. We're not going to mm. challenge this. I try to imagine going back in time and saying to Andrew, okay, Go back to 1994, say, and when he's in this little cottage in Provincetown writing this crazy book, saying, okay, you're not going to believe me. 26 years from now, you're going to be alive, right? Mm. Great news. You're going to be married to a man. Uh, that's not the best news. The Supreme Court of the United States is going to quote this book you're writing mm. now <laughs> in its ruling, wow. making it wow. mandatory for yeah. every state in the United States to introduce gay marriage. And I'll be with you the next day when you receive an invitation from the President of the United States to go to a White House that will be lit up in the colours of the rainbow flag <laughs> to celebrate what you and all these other people have achieved. Oh, and by the way, that President, he's going to be black, right? <laughs> it would have sounded like the most absurd, it'd be like me saying to you guys, you know, 26 years from now, a transgender president is going to invite us to smoke crack in the Oval Office. Oh my God, that is going to be, I actually want you to tell both of us what's going to happen in our life 26 years from now. That's an incredible so story, man. The things That's I'm gonna, arguing wow. for, you're, we're talking about overturning 2,000 mm. years of homophobia, right? Mm. The things we're talking about are e gay people, you know, we're a small minority, right? Mm. Um, there aren't that many gay people. Pretty much everyone in Britain and the United States and across the Western world is being affected by one of the nine causes, at least, of depression and anxiety. I'm talking about we're not mm. all depressed, but everyone's life is being diminished to some degree by some of these mm. causes, right? Now, so in some ways, that means the causes go deeper, but in some ways, it means it's easier to build coalitions. And one of the things I learned is that the struggle is the solution, right? That part of the necessary solution mm. is coming together, not as isolated individuals, mm. but uniting. And, and again, that can sound kind of... You know, I learned lots of these things from these experts, but there were so many places where emotionally it fell into place for me. And something that I think gives people a sense of what they can do. Can I tell you the story about something that happened in Berlin? Yeah, um, of course. In the summer of 2011, a Turkish German woman called Nuria Cengiz put a sign in her window on a big anonymous council project in Berlin. And uh, the sign said something like, I got my notice saying I'm being evicted next Thursday night, so on Wednesday I'm going to kill myself, mm. right? Wow. Now, this is a big anonymous housing project in a really run-down part of Berlin. Mm. It had been run down for a long time. And basically, only three groups of people had ever had lived there for years and years. Recent Muslim immigrants, gay people, and kind of punk squatters, right? Who you can imagine looked at each other with a lot of incomprehension. No one knew this woman. No one really knew anyone on this council estate. But people started to knock on her door, and they were like do you need any help? Mm. And Nuria was, said, fuck off, I don't want any help, I'm gonna kill myself, right? But people started talking outside her, she lived on the ground floor, people started talking outside her flat, and they, they realized, so there's a big thoroughfare that goes into the center of Berlin that goes through this place, it's called Cotty, mm -hmm. uh, and they thought, you know, they were all pissed off, their rent was going up, loads of people were being evicted. 
they thought, well, you know, if we just blocked the road for a day and we wheel Nuria out and we protest, the media will probably come, you know, an old woman in a wheelchair is going to kill herself. They'll probably, they'll probably let her stay in her flat. You know, we might get a bit of pressure to, you know, stop mm. our rents going up so much. So they did it, right? They blocked the road on a Saturday. Nuria was like, well, I'm going to kill myself. I may as well let them wheel me, wheel me out there. Um, so they stood there for the day. They protested. The media did come. And then they went home. And then at the end of the day, the police turned up and said, OK, you've had your fun. Take mm. it down, right? And uh, the people who lived there were like, well, hang on. You haven't told Nuria she gets to stay. And actually, we want a rent freeze. And they, of course, they knew the minute they left, the police would tear it down. So <laughs> Tanya, who's one of my favorite people there, she's at Tanya Gartner, her name is. She's, um, she's one of the punk squatters. She wears tiny miniskirts, even in Berlin winters. She's, <laughs> Tanya is hardcore. She had a klaxon in her flat. You know, since it makes a loud noise. She went and got it. She brought it down. And she said, OK, what we're going to do, we're going to drop a timetable to man this barricade. Mm. And when the police come, let off the klaxon yeah. and we'll all come down and stop them. Right. So people start signing up to, to man this barricade. People yeah. would never have met each other. Right. Yeah. So Tanya in her tiny miniskirt was paired with Nuria, the woman who put the sign in the window, who wears a full hijab, very conservative religious Muslim. I think they got, if I remember rightly, they were on the Thursday night shift. And... You know, they sit there, the first few nights they sit there, it's just super awkward. They're like, what the fuck have I got in common with this person? Yeah. Right? They started talking as the nights went on. Um, Nuria explained that she had come to Berlin when she was 17 years old from her village in Turkey with her two kids. And the idea was she would come, she would raise enough money to send back home for her husband. But after she'd been there for a year and she'd nearly saved up the money, she got word from home that her husband had died. She told Tanya something she'd never told anyone. She... She explained that um, her, she'd always told people her husband had died of a heart attack. He actually died of tuberculosis, which was regarded as a disease of poverty. She'd been really ashamed of that. Tanya started telling Nuria something she didn't normally talk about. She'd been thrown out of home by her middle class family when she was 15. She made her way to Cotty. She lived in a squat. She got pregnant when she was 16. They'd both been alone in this place mm. when they were teenagers with their own children. They started to realise how much they had in common. This, these kind of pairings were happening all over Cotty. And directly opposite this council estate, there's a, a gay club called Zudblock, which is run by a man I absolutely love called Rickard Strauss, who, um, <laughs> to give you a sense of what they're like, the previous place Rickard owned was called Cafe Anal, right? So they're pretty <laughs> uncompromising, <laughs> hardcore gays, right? So when they'd initially opened this club a few years before, mm. you know, a lot of religious Muslims in this area, they'd had their windows smashed, people were really pissed off. Mm. They said to the, the protesters, you know, you can have all your meetings in our club. They gave loads of their their um, furniture to the, mm. the the barricades, which actually got turned into a permanent structure, kind of shelter. Um, and at first, even the lefties at Cotty were like, listen, mate, we're not going to get these religious Muslims to come and have a meeting mm. underneath the poster for fisting night. It's not going to happen, right? <laughs> but actually, they did They yeah. did start having the meetings there. As one of the people there said to me, we all realised we had to take these small steps, mm. right? After this had been going on for about a year, and they had a rent freeze, a guy turned up one day called Tunkai, and um, Tunkai was in his early 50s at that time. He, and when you meet him, you realise he's got some cognitive difficulties. And he'd been living homeless. And he started saying he wanted to help out. And everyone just immediately liked him. He united the Muslims, the gays and the punks that started liking him. And um, after a little while, they started saying, well, you should sleep in this structure we built. We'd rather you were sleeping here than on the streets. right? So he started sleeping there. He became like one of the much loved kind of staples of the this, this protest camp. And after he'd been there for about a year, one day the police came to inspect. They would do this every now and then. And Tunkai doesn't like it when people argue. Mm. He thought the police were arguing, so he went to try to hug one of the police officers, and they thought he was attacking them, so mm. they arrested him. That was when it was discovered that Tunkai had been shut away in a psychiatric, a psychiatric hospital for 20 years, had escaped, had been living on the streets for a few months, and had found his way to Cotty. So they took him back to this psychiatric hospital out in the suburbs of Berlin. This whole protest camp turned itself into a free Tunkai movement, right? right? They descended on this psychiatric hospital. Yeah. And I remember these psychiatrists just being completely baffled, like this, these women yeah. in hijabs, these very camp gay men yeah. and these punks saying, give him back, right? Yeah. I remember Uli, one of the people there said to them, you know, he doesn't belong with you. He yeah. belongs with us. We yeah. love him. You don't love him. And I was very conscious, you know, how many of us, if someone carried us away, mm. would have hundreds of people saying, no, this person... Mm. belongs with us right M many things happened at Cotty. i mean the headline is they got a rent freeze for their entire housing project and then they launched a referendum initiative that got to get uh, uh, rents held down across the city which got the largest number of written signatures in the history of the city of berlin mm. but i remember the last time i saw nuria the woman who started this protest she said to me you know i'm really glad i got to stay in my neighborhood that's great but i gained so much more than that right yeah. i was surrounded by all these amazing people all alone and i, I never knew Mm. And 
I kept thinking about that. I kept thinking about one of the other Turkish German women there, Neriman, said to me um, that when she'd grown up in Turkey, what she called home was her village, right? And then she came to the Western world and she learned that what you're meant to call home is your four walls. Mm. And then this, this mm. protest began and she started to call the whole place home, right? right? And she said, I realized I was homeless all those years, that yeah. we're, we're homeless in this culture, right? As a sort of final uh, titbit, what have you bought us for our, for our dessert? Oh, so the dessert is how can a cow be an antidepressant? And it was just a kind of last thought, which is yeah. something that totally, uh, one of those moments in the research for the book three as I was researching it, it kind of fell into place for me. How can a cow be an antidepressant, <laughs> Johan? It's funny you should ask ah. that. <laughs> uh, so I went to interview the South African psychiatrist called Derek Summerfield. Mm. Derek happened to be in Cambodia in 2001 when they first introduced chemical antidepressants in that country. And the local doctors were like, what are these drugs? They'd never heard of them. And Derek explained and they said to him, oh, we don't need them. We've got antidepressants already. Mm. And he said, what are they? And he thought they were going to talk about some kind of, you know, local herbal treatment or whatever. Instead, they told him a story. There was a farmer in their community who worked in the rice fields. And one day he stood on a landmine and got his leg blown off, Mm. left over by the American invasion of Southeast Asia. And they gave him an artificial limb and he went back to work in the rice fields. But apparently it's fucking agony to work underwater with an artificial limb. I imagine it's pretty traumatic for obvious reasons. Mm. Guy starts to cry all day, doesn't want to get out of bed, classic depression. Mm. They said to Derek, so we gave him an antidepressant. Derek said, well, what was it? They explained that they went and sat with him. They listened to him. They realized that his pain made sense. They figured if they bought him a cow, uh, he could become a dairy farmer. He wouldn't be in this situation that was fucking him up. They bought him a cow. Within a few weeks, he stopped crying. Within a month, his depression was gone. They said to Derek, so that cow, that's an antidepressant. That's what you mean, right? What those Cambodian doctors knew intuitively Mm. is what the leading medical body in the world, the World Health Organization, have been trying to tell us for years. Your pain makes sense. We feel these things for a reason. Mm. And the best solution is to deal with these deep underlying reasons. I think that's the most, that is the most profound part of any type of healing. Like anyone I know who's done therapy at all, talks about the idea that what they didn't realize at all was their body was signaling them it's just trying to tell them something talk or share Mm. you know and and i think that we've become so bad Mm. at realizing any of that and i think that's why you know then you have addiction to to, to substances because then it's it sort of that allows you people get drunk they talk it's it's okay now i can say these things Mm. and i'm safe to say them yeah, I go yeah. through in the book like seven different kinds of antidepressant, which mm. stru- I want to stress again, should be offered alongside chemical antidepressants. It isn't about taking anything mm. off the menu. It's about expanding the menu. Um, and yeah, I mean, there are seven kinds of cows for seven kinds of problems, but there will be many more things. And once you, one of the good things about this is that once you reorient, once you begin mm. to see depression exactly as you say, as a signal rather than a pathology, mm. that opens up a whole different way of looking mm. for solutions that you start to see. The, like I said, the worst thing about telling people it's a chemical imbalance is it cuts the individual off from finding the sources of pain in yeah. her life and it cuts the society off mm. from finding these causes more generally. And I don't think it's a coincidence, I'm not implying anyone consciously planned it this way, it's not a conspiracy. It's not a coincidence that, you know, we had this age of rising corporate power and rising inequality. And then we said to everyone, I mean, the reason you all feel like so shit, feel like such shit is just because of a problem inside your brain. Totally. Right. It's because that's very convenient to the power structure we have. It's not conscious. They don't plan it that way, obviously. But it, and we, it ends up being a very convenient way of explaining people's pain to them. Well, listen, we could literally talk about this for mm. hours. Johan, thank you, thank so, you so, so, uh, so, so oh, much. Can, anyone who wants any more information about the yeah. book, they can listen to audio of all the people we've been talking about Great. they can take a quiz to see how much they know about depression and anxiety they can find out what lots of different people have said about the book from Russell Brand to mm. Elton John to yeah. Hillary Clinton Absolutely fascinating. to Naomi Klein to Glenn find, Greenwald find well, so, so where can we find it? Uh, it's at www.theloscollections.com. They can also find out, since you are listening to a podcast, where you can get the audio book. Mm. And they can also see where they can follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I had this weird experience recently where I did an interview. At the end, they were like, what's your Twitter? What's your Facebook? And then said, what's your Snapchat? And I was like, <laughs> I am a 39-year-old man, right? The only 39-year-olds on Snapchat are certainly pedophiles, yeah. right? What, what are you talking about? It was a right? test. I will go along. Exactly. That should be how we should, that should be the new equivalent of to catch a predator yeah. you know, that yeah. show in America. God, it's literally so just bad. go around. I'd say to adults, what's your Snapchat? And they just um, immediately preemptively arrest them. Listen, yeah. on that horrendous, 
bombshell. We'll say thank you to Hani Ari. Guys, this is exactly why we wanted to do News Roast, is to actually have guests on to talk about, you know, subjects that maybe, I uh, don't know, affect you, affect people you know. Uh, please support the podcast. Uh, please, please share it, rate and review it. And we'll be back soon with more. Thank you very much. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Hani Ari. Thank you.